Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the course Decoding Comic Studies and Reading Graphic Narratives in 21st Century India. So uh, what I'll be doing in this lecture number 18, this, it, this lecture number 18 is the continuation of the lecture number 17. So in the lecture number 17, uh, we were talking about advanced comic theories and criticism. So <coughs> it suggests that we have already gone through certain theory and criticism. Let's say, for example, uh, we have already seen the work of Bill Asner. We have already seen the work of Scott McCloud. We have already seen the work of Gwen Steen and many other thinkers and their contribution, their uh, way forward. It means that how are they going to take it further and their challenges to the other artist that how are they going to write or how are they going to produce comics, right? So, uh, but what we interestingly see in today's, which means advanced comic theory and criticism, the people uh, <coughs> like Bishaw Schutz and others, Khon, which we are talking today, they are the one who are making a departure from uh, previous uh, theory and criticism. So, here we have someone who are uh, arguing for women who are arguing for oppressed people and they are raising their voices right so i have already talked in the lecture number 17 the contribution of a certain comic thinkers that what would be the concept of alternative comics so so we defined that when we are going to look at alternative comics so which means that something which was not catered not addressed by mainstream comics. So, in response to that, alternative comics emerged. Second interesting thing also, we discussed that literature and comics. So, we saw uh, comics and literature, the essay that we were talking about in the last class, that how uh, comics can also be read the way we read literature. So, which means there was an attempt to make that literature, uh, comics is very much part of a literature. So see, interesting thing about these lectures are that there are certain things which we had not discussed and we are discussing it. So therefore, the interesting point is that as a student of a comic studies, if we want to uh, proceed for the right, the one question that keep haunts us that how we are going to approach comics what are the issues that we are supposed to address, uh, what are the things either whether they are being talked or not talked. So here I am giving you suggestions as well, opinions and also ideas that how you can look at certain available uh, books and if you read them, you will have a, a another uh, important argument to make in your research proposal. And second thing like if you read uh, the book that I have been suggesting to you is that the question comes in an interview that oh, how, how, why are you working on comic studies or let's say comics because this is not a part of a literature. So you can quote these people and strongly make an argument that no, they are very much part of a literature. So what, I'm, uh, what I have thought of when I am, uh, what, what, I, what I thought when I was uh, framing this course is this that there are certain challenges that our students face in our everyday life. So when they are facing these challenges in our everyday life, they can read these things, they can look at look up to my suggestions and I am sure that when they are bringing a proposal before the interview panel, they will not be able to be hesitant to say that yes, we are coming with the comics but we want to work in the literature department. Second thing is that if you see there are a lot of uh, oppressed marginalized identity 
they are also uh, addressed they are also addressed by comic uh, writers so our job is to find out those people let's say for example when i was talking about alternative comics i told you certain names so you go through them you read them and then you can propose a plan ki this is uh, i am working on and they also talk about a different forms of a cultural identity right so what i'm talking about like why it is relevant to listen or to discuss on advanced comic theory and criticism and that is a particular reason i have taken this uh, issue in a very detailed way so that i can make your concepts quite clear for a future all right so go back to the slides and you see that if you see the slide you realize that uh, uh, I mean, I uh, talked about these two people and then clearly uh, written with a measured flow, the book's uh, uh, main text, right? The main text, which means I am talking about uh, the visual of, just a second, language comics, right? So, this is a continuation of something where we left in the last class. So, clearly written with a measured flow the book's main text is split into two parts the bulk of the pages dedicated to the first section's description and definition of the structure of a visual language right and these five chapter take the reader from identifying narrative like naming some uh, basic uh, morphological elements of visual language through the articulating right through the articulating uh, uh, through the articulating narrative structure and proposing theories on how our brain might process it right so Kohn acknowledges that a key step in establishing his theory is to determine whether a system of a shared patterned sign exist although doubt have been raised over whether there is a genuine lexicon for this modality so no precise translation from the verbal to the graphic can be offered as uh, uh, Kohn has already pointed this out individual panels in a comic cannot usually be said to represent a single word however he built his argument around how visual element how visual element could perform similar functions to units in verbal and sign language and how these are stored in memory right so the contribution that is uh, being made by Kohn is that uh, we have a sign languages right we are very much familiar with the phoneme and morpheme of a sign languages and in our everyday life uh, we try to talk in a sign languages and uh, we discuss and whatever we read also they are a sign languages right what Kohn is uh, trying to suggest us that these uh, visual elements right visual elements also function like a verbal language right so uh, what Kohn is trying to understand what is trying to suggest that visual language can also function like a sign language right and they can perform similar function right the function of either it is a visual language or it is a verbal language they both can go together so this is a something very interesting point that is being uh, made by Kohn so let me uh, show you the slide again and you see that the slide here right so one simple but effective example what Kohn described as a affixes right I am writing it for you right affixes which act in a similar way as a suffixes for words right. So here you remember what I am trying to suggest you is that how visual language can also be read the way we read sign language right so uh, note this down so affixes affixes function in the same way the way a sign uh, the way suffix work 
So, for instance, now you can uh, see uh, on your screen, uh, for instance, a light bulb above a head, right? Look at this, a light bulb above a head. Uh, a light bulb above a head to signify a person having an idea is a widely recognized image, right? So, this image simply suggests that he has got some idea and this, this idea that this person has got an idea is showed by this particular visual image, alright? So, now you see and the one that Cohen proposes is a part of a visual lexicon, right? This is a something uh, interesting, right? Visual lexicon. So, uh, as like and visual le lexicon is also a systematic construct subject to rules, right? And uh, the light bulb need to be above the head for it to have the desired meaning. Placing at the side does not have the same effect, right? So, the point is, let us say for example, I am sure that you all are familiar, familiar with the semiotics, right? I am sure that you all have read semiotics and uh, uh, Charles and the Spears, Jane Austen and uh, Shashur, right? Cost of general linguistic, one of the important a book that we read in, uh, in the structuralism. What does it suggest, right? There are signifier and there is a signified, right? A particular sign can only make a meaning, right, if it is being produced in that difference and obviously in a particular followed by particular rules and conventions. So, let us say for example, that I saw a cat, right. So, cat has a meaning in a difference to bat, rat, so on and so forth. And it should be, it should, it, it is all, all also making the meaning because we are following a particular rule. I saw a cat. If I say, I cat saw a, it will not make sense to you, right? Because it is not being subjected to any particular rules. There is no such convention which is being, what, with which this particular fa parole is being followed by. So, let us say for example, uh, so this is a similar idea and I am sure you are familiar with. Now, uh, look at uh, uh, the image that I am showing you. So, visual lexicon, which means that a person's bulb, like a, a bulb above the head of a person will only make a meaning if it is on the above of a head. If suppose the light bulb is on my side or this side or that side, it is not following any rule. So, which means that this visual lexicon is meaningless it is not making uh, any meaning, right? So, understand, I am uh, going slowly because I want you to understand this. So, verbal sign, right, function in the same way the way visual sign or visual sign function in the same way the way verbal sign. So, visual lexicon can also be produced and that is something new and challenging. So, that is exactly what Cohen is making an argument, all right? So, uh, uh, look at the slide again and uh, and see that if you see the slide, what you uh, realize on the slide that uh, uh, this uh, the purpose like however, the purpose of the book is not to provide an exhaustive list of the uses of uh, let us say uh, fight clouds, impact stars or other visual morphemes, right? Right, so it's not that uh, the book that Khan is giving it to you, where he is going to produce a number of a list or let's say 500 or 1000 and talking about that this is a this is a morphemes or visual morphemes, right? Not I mean uh, uh, verbal morpheme, I mean visual morphemes or let's say visual phonemes. But he's he's trying to suggest uh, this is the argument that he's making by showing certain examples that this is how visual morpheme can also function, all right? So, this is a point that uh, Cohen is making and I am telling it to you. So, now look at the slide again and you realize that uh, Cohen's uh, main uh, ambition is to address the 
cognition of a sequential images using linguistic as a theoretical and methodological framework right hence the book utilizes tree diagrams right as used to identify the phrase structure within verbal sentences to give plausible description of the function of a constituent panels in various strips landmark concepts and experiments in linguistic are recalled and replayed with comics too as we all are very much familiar with the name of a uh, name chomsky who's uh, transformative right tg grammar basically transformation generative grammar and syntax the person he is known for so noam chomsky's example of a meaningless sentence that obeys rules of a grammar let's say for example color let's say for example colorless green ideas sleep furiously inspire the rearrangement of a panel in a bid to create a similarly syntactically correct structure that has a no coherent meaning right so if you look at the sentence colorless green ideas sleep furiously right colorless green ideas sleep furiously grammatically this sentence is correct right uh, it is a following subject is a following object and verb but the problem is that every sentence produced even if it is a following a rule it's a possible that it is not giving a meaning to us right let's say for example the example shown to you colorless green ideas sleep furiously right so this this is not a making a sentence so here you see that comic artists are also highly influenced by noam chomsky and khon is making this one of the important argument and the argument is that even there is a possibility that if panels are not being arranged what noam chomsky is suggesting in terms of a verbal language it will not be also able to produce a meaning so therefore we should stick to we should stick to what noam chomsky is suggesting for a verbal language same for comic language as well so going back to the slide again if you see this slide what you find that the second section of the book uh, sees cohen applying some of his finding and principle to three manifestation of a uh, uh, manifestation of a visual language around the world one is a uh, american japanese and celt australian visual language right with the latter demanding most challenging deployment of cohen's theories right so the point is that it's not that every language as we know that uh, sign language uh, uh, as we are very much familiar with the concept that uh, sign language cannot be applied like the rule theory given by shashur or noam chomsky cannot be applied on all the language that exist on the world right in fact uh, what shashur said uh, was not applicable to chinese language right so if we are familiar with the chinese language if you look at the structure rules and grammar of a chinese language we know that shashurian's idea cannot uh, be applicable to uh, uh, chinese language in fact uh, there are some more other scripts it is not possible to apply over there so in fact this is a problem the same thing that uh, cohen also faced that the certain ideas the theories that was given by him it seems to us that it, it is not applicable to all right so keeping this certain exception in the mind we have to read cohen's theories all right so look at the slides again and you see that the next argument is that the american examples uh, include superhero cartoon and independent comic strips right and the japanese visual language is represented by manga right now you see all widely recognized representation with some evident similarities right however the sand drawing used by aboriginal communities in central australia are an articulation of a very different visual language so i am just here giving you a kind of a sense to you 
that how uh, uh, certain uh, rules cannot be applicable it, it is it is you have to respect the varieties and diversities that exist in different languages in terms of a the, uh, in terms of a comics right so graphic representation uh, drawn in sand to augment spoken conversation their real time production and inherent impermanence give a distinct utility and efficiency to the science used so unless a selection are reproduced in the book providing stimulating visual variation although most of cohen's research has thus far involved comic comics in a strip and book form introducing the sand drawings right sand drawings sand drawings allows him the reader to start exploring the common commonalities and contrast of a visual languages beyond more familiar instantiations right now uh, after listening to what cohen is saying let's uh, look at the critique that we offer for cohen's work right so cohen might not have the persuasive charm of a macleod nor are his theories are seductively straightforward as panel transition and closer but his work exhibits a dogged quest for rigor that give this book an authoritative tone so viewing his investigation as part of the nascent field of a visual language research and distinct from the semiotic approach to comics of agronstein the author rarely admits there are many uncertainties to be resolved as he strives to reconcile the visual graphic graphic modality to other modes of human communication so perhaps the biggest question the book ask is one that demands consideration by any current or future researcher right what is that why should the brain create several unique and diverse ways to handle different behavior when it can efficiently make use of various general underlying structures so those with the desire to answer either in corroboration or to the contrary will find this book a thoughtful and useful useful companion to their studies so so one of the important argument that is being made right this is the question that is on your screen that why should the brain create several unique and diverse ways to handle different behavior when it can efficiently make use of various general underlying structure so this is a something uh, which uh, is already being echoed in noam chomsky's ideas and arguments all right so uh, moving ahead now we have uh, something uh, a different and some uh, another person called hana mudrag right uh, we are going to uh, know about uh, hana mudrag is a scholar who has written extensively on comics and language right as the book itself suggest comics and language reimagining critical discourse on the form right so if you see uh, most of the thinkers have been emphasizing upon how are we going to look at the form of a comics right how are we going to look at the language of a comics and which is why uh, it becomes a very interesting to see a new kind of a theory and criticism emerging in the field of a comic studies and the way they are uh, producing the idea in terms of a uh, uh, comic language or comic medium or the form right so which is why i have uh, picked up the another one hana mudrag right for your convenience let's see what she has to offer so if you look at the title uh, comics and language on your uh, screen uh, rethinking critical discourse on the form so it's a more uh, going to speak on how form is going to be in relation to the comics right so that is a kind of a concern for these theoreticians where they are constantly uh, thinking about the form of a comics or let's say language of a comics right so let's uh, look at the slide we, we, we would like to know more about her, uh, her book so here you see on the screen that her work challenges 
many of the key assumptions about the grammar and formal characteristics of a comics and offer a more nuanced and complex understanding of the medium. She has introduced a radically innovative caricatural style and a conception of a comics as a language in their own right. So, uh, Biodrag's book Comics and a Language Reimagining Critical Discourse on the Form engages in close reading of comics, right? So, and, and uses accessible theory to expose the problems embedded in the ways critics have used ideas of a language. So, her work has been published in the International Journal of a Comic Art and the Journal of a Graphic Novels and Comics. Miodrag is a postdoctoral fellow of English at the University of Leicester, right. So, this is a, her a, a brief introduction. So, now let us look at her book. So, comics and a language consist of a three parts, right. One, language in comics right. Second, comics as language, right. And the third, uh, image as a language, right. So, so, see what interesting thing that we are noticing, right. As we see comic in itself is a language, right. One. Second, we also see that uh, there is a language in comics itself available, right. And the third is important departure and we see image as a language. Now, you see when I say that I am looking at a language, right, we have to be very specific. Are we looking at a comic as a language or the language used in comics or the images that are used in the comics, they function as a language, right. So, this is a very interesting uh, uh, argument, right, that we can propose or as a researcher we can look at it uh, like let us say for example, if we are uh, going to look at Indian comics which I am going to discuss in the next lecture. So, what is the language used by Indian comics uh, artist, right. So, we will look at all these but uh, uh, focus on the slides. Sir. So, you see on the slide that Miodrag, right, uh, uh, eloquently articulated in the introduction. Miodrag's goal in the book is to amend the field's approach to comics criticism by examining how current literary and linguistic criticism in the field ultimately does a, a disservice to the form. So, Miodrag compels scholars toward a disciplinary reflexivity that has been a long time coming at least in uh, anglophone circles by identifying divergent discursive expectations and contradictory intellectual goals that have prevented a more sophisticated critical approach to the study of a comics. Uh, she qualifies the current approaches to comics scholarship as primarily defensive, then proceeds to problematize each using examples from comics. In each section of the book, Miodrag follows her criticism by proposing more deliberate and empirical conceptions or let us say applications of various literary and linguistic theories. For example, she problematizes the ways in which various literary and linguistic critical theories have been applied to comics. Miodrag stresses the importance of both verbal and visual signification, right. She insists that uh, a verbal and visual signification be considered in their own right, while some critics resist such a suggestion for a fear of unraveling the interdependent collaboration of text and image in the form. She presents a persuasive case for considering each individuality. Miodrag argues for scholars to consider several productive distinctions among theoretical approaches to comics that serve as a cohesive binds across the books uh, three parts, right. So, now here you see there is visible on your screen and I would say that you can pause a video for a minute 
and read it before what I speak, right? So, a suggestion is that stop a video for a second and see what it is offering to you, right? So, in part one, Miodrag argues that critiques too often sideline linguistic elements in the comics. In order to argue for linguistic elements as the basis of a comic's literariness, she uses examples from Harriman's Crazy Cat, right? Demonstrating how language play and not simply narrativity defines a text as a literary. Miodrag's reading of a several crazy cats strips illustrate not only the power inherent in language system that I mean long, but also just how resistant linguistic structure is to challenge. So, Ignat's many act of disruptive communication for example, results in a humor in the comics and Miodrag argues that by their very nonsensical nature, they are seen as a outside of a acceptable language use and therefore, not a serious defiance, right? So, uh, that is a particular reason why I said that you should uh, pause this video, right? And read it. So, uh, you will see that how these languages used in these strips to what Modrag is saying confirms, right? So, most of the times what we have noticed that our critiques have uh, ignored uh, linguistic contribution or the way artists use language, right? And Miodrag is making an argument that we should not ignore uh, the language because language is a very powerful women, uh, powerful weapon and it is used to convey something more than that, right? And how the language of a comics defines that it is a comics, right? Like if I say that uh, in other words that for the like to say something is a comic, we have to stick to the definition and to the de definition she is arguing that language is one important tool to say and which is why she looks at the example from Crazy Cat and trying to show from certain strips that see how the language is used. So, as a research scholar, as a student, our job is when we are reading comics, we are also supposed to pay our attention to the uses of a language, right? And how disruptive language is trying to convey something else. It is not a defiance, but in the form of a defiance, it is producing some new narratives, all right? So, uh, going back to the slides, I would, as I suggested, pause the video before you uh, read uh, further or listen to me, right? So, here you see a literary analysis of a, a crazy cat in the first chapter is a followed by Shashurian analysis of a comic, sorry, of a language in Alindra Berry's work in the second, right? This is a book making comics by Lindra Berry in the second. In order to further reinforce that the overarching systematic qualities of a language are unique to linguistic signification. The author takes up claim by MacLeod, Cohen, Kress and Van Leeuwen. She concludes by articulating the primary distinction like the role played by the Lang distinguishes visual and verbal as respectively a system in which signs are made, right? Signs are made and a system in which signs are used in language speakers are always reusing pre-existing signs, whereas visual significations affords a scope for creating new ones, alright. So, now here we are going to look at something uh, more in detail. So, prior efforts to deny any hierarchical relationship between verbal and visual have resulted in a false conclusion that the two sign systems are distinct. In the comic uh, form, Myodog uh, Miodrag responds to this refusal in her analysis of literary language within comics. In chapter 3, for example, uh, she explores the work of Will Eisner, Ellen Murray and Posey Simmons in terms of a spatial arrangement of the words. Miodrag acknowledges that the visual materialization of linguistic shine on the page that is words affects that is affected by 
the pictorial content and it is the evolving relationship between these within the web of the entire work that produces the text of full effect. Mudrak's conceptualization of a comics as a web or network relies on this very understanding verbal and visual signification are vital components and uh, that is precisely why each should be considered as a distinct entity and as a projectively part of the whole. Mudrak concludes part 1 with an especially salient claim and important warning in regard to linguistic science. Critics agree that visual is a vital to comics, but in acknowledging this we must not overlook the potential centrality of a text, always of a material, graf graphic, space out words in shaping these visual works as much and potentially more than do iconic pictures. Now, she argues for the distinction like Mudrag is also acutely aware of how the relationship between word and image is vital, right? And now not unique to the form, but obviously word and image are vital to the form. See, so what I am going to do now for your convenience, I uh, will uh, quickly uh, uh, go through the slides, I will read it out for your convenience and so that wherever you see there is some certain important points are being made, you can note down in your uh, rough book and later on you can listen to me and see the slides, alright. So now we will just read the slides and you have to just read the slides on your screen and listen to me. So now you see uh, that in part 2, Mudrag explores the ways in which word and image interact in several comics examples, reminiscent of MacLeod's taxonomy of word or picture combination. Uh, ultimately, she concludes that claiming claims regarding the nature of a word or image interaction cannot and should not speak for the form as a whole. No single case of a word image interaction should be made to represent the full range of possible interactions. She focuses primarily on visual signification using city of a glass to argue that the effect of a sequence, effect of a sequence depends on the palpable and resonant gap between what is said and what is seen with word and image necessarily remaining distinct in order for this reciprocal upsetting and countering to occur. Now the image itself can make a secondary role in terms of a driving narrative direction. Mudrag urges us to acknowledge that the atmospheric contribution this picture make is not negligible because they contribute little additional information. They are metaphorical, engaging and imagin imaginatively arousing. Mudrag argues then that comics verbal visual interaction should be referred to as a hybrid because the term acknowledges that this new whole is formed from two constituent elements, totalities in their own right that are ontologically separate entities and so avoids the problem inherent in uh, positing the form as a language whose interacting element somehow override their uh, dual consist, uh, consistency. Now uh, continuing the part 2, what we see comics hybridity for example is enacted in instances of a materialized visualization of a verbal sign like the infamous POW. Relying once again on linguistic structuralism, Mudrag argues that this powerful POW is both visual and uh, verbal at once but does not then somehow become neither. We lose nothing of either of the separable visual and verbal elements, thou each adds something to the other. If Pao were typed instead of a drawn, for example, the very same linguistic signifier would be read in entirely different ways. Its relationship to the visual signifier creates the difference. Mudrak quotes author Sabine Gross in saying that learning to read means learning to stop considering letters and word as images. Mudrak's uses of a grass work provides much needed clarity at the conclusion of another theory heavy chapter. 
Inevitably, Meodrag argues, meaning making from the perspective of a comic reader refers not to reading differently, but reading repeatedly, each time applying a new lens of either visual or verbal signification or what Gross and Suits have described as a back and forth pattern. The speech balloon, which can be require readers to see text as a both image and language simultaneously is one aspect of the comics form that is unique simultaneity of narrative content is another. Mudrag identifies the two unique element of the comics form in part two. The speech balloon is a visualization of a words that precludes the easy dissection of a visual and vowel and the simultaneity of narrative segments on the two dimensional page. In chapter five, she further explores existing criticism on the visual element of the comic pulling largely from the film theory and problematizing such a disciplinary borrowing. Primarily, Meodrag argues that conceptualizing the comics panel as formally similar to the film sort is not the most productive application of a film theory because in the comic within the page simultaneous panel can participate in waves of interrelationship that violate narrative sequence. Relying heavily on the work of Neil Cohen, he identifies why existing scholarship on sequence in comics is so problematic. For one, she argues, panel sequence does not denote narrative time, but more often than not reading time. Secondly, over general comparisons with the linguistic structural model, little illuminate the way texts are organized and read. However, Cohen argues that panel structure equate to an organizing principle not unlike language grammar. Meodrag diverge on this point and instead uses it to further problematize the idea that narrative time and reading time share a linear sequence. Rather, non-linear sequence is also possible in comics, an aspect of the two-dimensional form to which film theory cannot pertain. So, in this way, we are to use a metaphor to describe comics, Meodrag suggests be abundant sequence and embrace network in order to reflect the ways in which reader actually move through or have the ability to move through segments in a linear or uh, non-linear fashion. So see, as I was talking about that, it is a more theoretical parts which does not need much explanation. But one point that I would like to make which probably you, if you have missed it, that they, they see is also in the favor of a network, but not in the linear sequence of a narrative, right. So this is a new way uh, that is emerging in comics and I am sure that you will uh, uh, read uh, the slides carefully because uh, the slides that I have prepared for you, it requires your uh, attention, uh, pause the video, read the slides and then move further, then only you can understand, right, because it is a bit complex, alright. However, I have uh, talked before, but uh, still. So, in the third and final section, Meodrag continues to contest claim that comics are a language or that visual signification is comparable to that of verbal by chapter 9, she begins to articulate the way in which the composition of the page can be seen to parallel semiotic system in productive ways. Just not as broadly, broadly as the language denotes, in other words, the meaning making structure of a single comics text is indeed a semiotic system, particularly as it consists of a logical connection through motivated science and familiar conventions. However, though the language is a semiotic system, the logic does not work in reverse. Not all semiotic system constitute the overarching social structure of a linguistic lang long. Just before the conclusion of the text, she so writes like any semiotic system meaning depends on differential relationships and individual panels are imbued uh, uh, with a significance that is dependent on their place within a larger system. However, their values are constructed within the bounds of individual text, the language of the text and are often additionally imbued with significance through their context. Composition is a system of a 
a motivated form whose significance of an interpretable in ways arbitrary language is not. I strength of this final section and of the book as a whole, uh, Meudrog's delineation of which scholarship has been productive in moving the field towards a more standardized critical discourse. In fact, Meudrog's certainty regarding the boundaries of a comics formal features supported by her thoughtful consideration and application of these critical lenses carves a helpful and liberating path for future scholarship. By resolutely excluding images from the long, we can abandon our preoccupation with fitting formal and organizing principles of a language to the visual. Theory is, after all, only as effective so far as it helps comic scholars to articulate phenomena of meaning making. If we follow Meodoc's approach, we are free to explore other criticism that may map more productively to the form than did the ill-fitting formal and organizing principle of linguistic grammar, syntax and other. So, among the most uh, uh, compelling uh, finding from Meodoc's work on comics is that many of the elements we profess to be unique in the form or in fact not four major points right that is already available on the screen four major uh, uh, four major points constitute the meat of these findings one let's say for example a collaborative play of a word and images as a hybrid right collaborative play of a word and image Right. Let's say, for example, uh, uh, incorporation of literary writing in multimodal form, closer required from audience and sequentiality. Right. So she defines collaborative play of a word and image as a hybrid, but the expansive re repertoire of possible word image combination is not unique to the comic forms. Right. So it reminds us that such combination regularly occur often in other media such as film, print advertisements and corporate logos. Incorporation of literary writing is not unique either. Other media regularly rely on high creative verbal signification for meaning making. Even MacLeod's tenet of a closer did not make the cut for, as he argues through Ernst Gombrich, there is no representation that leaves nothing to the imagination right be fill in unheard words in conversation overlook misprints deduce the correct word when reading infer familiar images from loose or abstracted representations finally sequentiality in narrative right sequentiality in narrative a vital modifier in MacLeod's definition of a comics sequential art does not hold the key to understanding the comics from despite its current role as a cornerstone of a current conception of the form. Because Meodrag so fearlessly leaves no cornerstone altered, we could expect to see discussion of element unique are not unique to the comic form take a more prominent focus in the text organization and framing, perhaps via more emphasis in the introduction or the conclusion. So, in terms uh, of uh, elements unique to comics, our discussion of the part 2 already identifies 3, the speech balloon, the simultaneity of narrative content or the two dimensional page and the unique network that requires us to scan, rescan the various relationship between the various segments in this composition, right. So, Meodrag articulates one more element unique to the form, its divergence from prose literature. Right, like uh, comics have formal limits that necessarily challenge literary lenses of the word play. Now, let us uh, talk about the limitation of Meodrag's work. Perhaps the large setback of Meodrag's argument is that thou she leads with a chapter on a language in comics as potentially literary, she so does not problematize the very aim of literariness soon enough. Toward the conclusion of a part 1, Meodrag writes that due caution must be taken 
when applying neighboring analytical paradigm such as literary close reading to the comics form such application can only ever be starting point for or a fully developed theory of a comics we cannot simply build a comics theory from pieces of existing theory without attuning these to the art forms particularities uh, Mudrag also clarifies however that applying literary analysis to better understand comics verbal signification does not mean every comic should be evaluated by its literariness this clarification is one that could have anticipated uh, since chapter 1 but did not appear until chapter 3 a large faction of anglophone scholars consciously avoids the academic colonization of a comics by attempting to elevate their position in popular mass culture to one of a more hybrid nature in order to articulate the whole she sees in existing theory Mio drag is forced to cage exception to the rule until she has articulated a countering amendment but her acknowledgement that comics writing is divergent from prose literature does not like does indeed come what follows is another thoughtful consideration of how the comics form is indeed not a mere hybrid of a graphic art and prose literature because of the possibility for visual arrangements to create literary effects Meodrak's cautionary tale of haphazardly applying neighboring analytical paradigm either literary or otherwise is a central to text's purpose productive debates regarding the disciplinary purview of a comic studies can only serve to grow the field the existence of these very conversation brings us closer to uniting intellectual goals and establishing more convergent discursive expectations among a scholar a reading of Hannah Meodrak's comic and language gives us a revised understanding of the current state of a comic criticism and a, differ a deferred dream regarding future growth of the work we do. Right, so uh, see, uh, I know that what I spoke in last uh, 10 minutes, it seems a bit complex, but uh, as I suggested that you have to go through and read that book and I'm sure that uh, the book itself illuminates you in terms of the argument that it makes and uh, if you look at the slides closely uh, and listen to me what I have been speaking while looking at the slides I'm sure that there will not be a problem and the last we are going to look at Barbara Postema and her contribution right so in five to ten minutes we will wrap it up this lecture and where we are going to talk about what she has to say in uh, context of a theory and criticism all right so look at the barbara postema now is a lecturer in english for academics purpose at the university of uh, groningen in netherlands her research interests include american liter literature comic studies and narrative theories she has authored monograph titled narrative structure in comics making sense of a fragments and has written extensively on the topic of comics and graphic novels. Postema has also worked as a postdoctoral research fellow at Ryerson University in Toronto. She is a well respected scholar in the field, having published numerous articles and reviews. Barbara Postema's 2013 book on the structure of a comic text is beautifully presented by RIT Press. Admirably making use of a full color images in the interior or the comic extracts, Postema analysis and sporting handsome graphic design which is reflected in the following edition in RIT's uh, cultural studies and comic scholarship series. Narrative structure in comics builds on Postema's PhD thesis to present for a more general audience her focus on the gap in comics and its place in the process of reading graphic narrative from the detailed textual level uh, up to the level of narrative structure overall. So, in the same year, two other books in different ways use the resources, resources of a language and literature studies to craft an approach to comics. Neil calls the visual language of a comics, right? The Neil calls the visual language of a comics and Hannah Meadrock's comics and language, where Cohen pursues a scientific approach to comic form 
based on the linguistic of Noam Chomsky and Mudrak challenges the very idea that comic can be a language having no minimal units, Postema takes a middle line and pursues reading of a comic text that draws on a wide range of semiotic theory and narratology and aims to synthesis these with the work of a comics studies theorist including the newer approach offered by Grohan's team. So this short and re readable book is structured in five chapters which builds uh, an account of a comic narration from smaller to larger elements with the sort framing introduction interestingly post differs the sort of a general potted history of a comics which you might expect to find in an introduction to separate section in appendix where she also offers a glossary of key comics terms. So the glossary is a little idiosyncratic giving extensive discussion on some term notably cartooning and omitting others for instance emanata surprisingly conflating at others caption and word balloon are treated as one it would be useful to see this approach reconsidered in a future edition and a fuller glossary offered the history is a reasonable six page precise which might make a useful section to extract for a course which incorporates a graphic novel suggesting perhaps the audience at which this book is aimed since Postema offers many useful examples of close reading of a comic text with a broad theoretical base such as might make an accessible model for an undergraduate right. So this is a must read book for undergraduate. Chapter 1 discusses mode of signification within a single panel. The framed panel per Postema is basic uh, to the operation of a comic since the panel serves to define the outside the gutter the key gap which provides a space for the reader to engage with the comic uh, text creatively. Her main theoretical uh, uh, her main theoretical source in the chapter 1 is Ronald Barth is none of uh, uh, many quotes that simultaneously works to construct the text. The gutter is picked up on in chapter 2 which focuses on uh, which focuses on uh, the in between created by the inscription of multiple frames and draws on Groenstein's notion of a Iconic solidarity is created by the division of the page uh, into framed panels. Post tema particularly specifies the gap rather than the frame and is key for the gap may be created by white space but the gutter is always present and operative even if it is invisible. In chapter 2 the post tema offers the new piece of theory other than the proposal the gap is uh, central to the comic sexuality. So the uh, C outlines a five part taxonomy of the page layout is an alternative to Grunstein's tableau system. Uh, let's say post time I suggest panel framed by frame separated by the blank space, one panel per page, several panel per page, framed panels and grids. So she acknowledges this is a not a discrete and systematic division these approaches may be mixed in particular the use of frameless panels. So chapter 3 moves to the repeated a sequence of a panel builds from the four panel uh, peanut strip through James Stump's the Goelm's mighty swing to a discussion of a section of a Sutterbug foils by Jason Lithil. The eclecticism of post thema choices of a text to analyze is a strength of the book elsewhere. So she discusses a section, uh, she discusses a section from uh, uh, the amazing Spider-Man and the foot T1940 Fletcher Hank comics. He acknowledges a preference for the contemporary US independent graphic narrative such as Linda Berry or Craig Thompson's example but often explores beyond this including uh, newspaper strips such as Colvin and Hopes, right. So, uh, so these argument let's say about types of image sequence are, are sound and the close uh, reading are instructive. And the chapter 4 turns out to be the use of the words in the comic text and here uh, posits another kind of uh, a gap that between the two modes of expression this seems different in other order form the kinds of a gap previously alluded to which have been more akin to those uh, which bring about Scout MacLeod's closer and motivate the reader to imaginatively participate in the construction of the text. So there is a slippage in the uses of a term such as gap and blank which are both suggestive uh, but also at times a bit little obscure. This chapter affords the opportunity to discuss comic which narrates without words as well as in one which words make image redundant. So this tension right in Lena Berry's work for example presents the gap as a mismatch 
between messages which the reader is driven to reconcile rather than lacuna which the reader to fill. The final chapter engages with a narratology in its attention to the story as a whole and here there is explicit reference to the Wolfgang Escher as well as narratologists such as Simeon Chapman and Barth in order to point out the use of enigmas, absences, indeterminacies is called to all narrative including comics. Uh, uh, the focus moves to the work of the reader in resolving these absences. Postema frames Gronstein's braiding in this theoretical context, she reserved the irresistible pun, mind the gap, which was used to little her, like uh, title her thesis submitted in 2010 for the final section of the book. So the notion of the gap is extended to uh, the absence of a parents in peanuts, the visual imagery in Charles Burns black hole and the asteroid cater in David McQuilly's Asteroids Polyps. So these broad uses of the term gap thereby makes for a useful flexible motif that ties together her interesting analysis of the comic text. So those extensive close reading alongside uh, uh, the beautiful full curl illustration of the material under discussion make this book an exam excellent example of a graphic narrative analysis. post reading are well argued and illuminating. It is not always clear that these readings strictly emerge from her central thesis that gaps are essential to comic meaning and it is the content that gives the basis of the reading. Gap is often brought in in the final sentence of the paragraph of a section as a way to round off the analysis and link forward to the next. But the breadth of a theory brought together here and the range of examples used in analysis together make narrative structure in comics an invaluable reader for those interested in engaging with the practical application of medium specific theory to comic text themselves right so this all are available on your slides i'm sure that you can pause and read it hopefully uh, this uh, book was uh, i mean this lecture was able to give an idea about the major development in the field of comic studies specifically in the last decade and one of the major aim of this lecture was to introduce you to the most uh, uh, recent influential wave of writing on comics as found in the work of Hilary Schutz, Charles Hatfield, Nehil Khon, Hannah Mirdrog and Barbara Postema. Right? So these are the five people uh, that I introduced to you. There are more but this is the general uh, their contribution in the last few decades. So uh, good luck for now read this uh, book and your work. Uh, so that we can understand it better, right? So uh, let's say uh, hold the uh, hold the class for today. See you next time. Take care. Bye bye.